Welcome to numerical methods. We are still in our section on random number generation, but we now started talking about generating drawings of other distributions. So I started introducing the method inversion of the distribution function. We will also discuss another method, yeah, acceptance, rejection here below. But really inversion of the distribution function is my favorite method also because it is so robust. I will comment on this and yeah, usually very, very fast. Acceptance rejection is also interesting because it links to weighted Monte Carlo. Yeah? And by studying it, we have a nice motivation for the weighted Monte Carlo method. We looked at an example in the inversion of the distribution function. So first, just recall what that is. So given a uniform distributed random variable, U, yeah, so uniform on zero one. So we know how to generate uniform distributed sequences of random numbers, given also the inverse of the distribution function F. So that was here F inverse is the inverse of the distribution function F. Then if we apply the inverse F to U, we get uh, X and this X has distribution function F, so it's F distributed. So by just knowing some analytic formula or by just having code yeah, that implements the inverse of the distribution function, we can generate an F distributed sequence out of a uniform distributed sequence. We already discussed an example that was how we generate a normal distributed sequence well, for the normal distribution, you do not have the inverse of the distribution function analytically, but we had a very accurate implementation. Yeah? So actually up to machine precision. And this is also an interesting thing here. Yeah? Often you do not need an analytic formula. It's enough to have an implementation that is accurate up to machine precision because there would be a rounding yeah, to the nearest floating point number Anyway, I would like to have a look at another example, exponentially distributed random variable. Well, maybe it's even the more simpler example, the easiest example, but uh, it's also nice to look at it because this uh, exponential distributed random variable has a very nice interpretation and also plays an important role in our application, mathematical finance. Uh, it is can be interpre interpreted as a random time, as a time where an event is happening. For example, bankruptcy of a company, yeah, default. So it's maybe a model for the default time. So here's the definition, exponentially distributed random variable, so an exponentially distributed random variable is given by the distribution function f, where f of x is 1 minus exponential minus lambda x with some parameter lambda, lambda larger than 0. For x larger or equal 0, and 0 for x less than 0. So you recall the distribution function is the probability that the random variable, let's call it here capital X, is less or equal little x. So you see that the probability to be in this region here is zero. So the values of my random variable are larger or equal zero. So it's maybe a random time span, yeah, starting from now, where now is t equals zero. The parameter lambda here is the slope of this function in x equals zero. OK, 
okay, how do we see this? Okay, we have to differentiate. So if I differentiate the capital X, I get the density. So this is df by dx. And I differentiate this guy. You have a minus exponential. Yeah, but then the minus lambda moves in front. So actually I have a plus lambda times exponential minus lambda x. And now if you plug in zero, f of zero, you just get lambda. So lambda is here the slope, okay, of this function, this parameter function. Later, we have even a much better interpretation for this lambda. So this lambda is a frequency, yeah, or kind of velocity. Yeah, let's apply now our inversion of the distribution function. So I have a random variable x, yeah, and I would like to generate this from a uniform one. So f of x is now the u, and I would like to invert this. So what do we have? I have 1 minus exponential minus lambda x. This is now equal to my u. Okay, bring the 1 to the other side. You have exponential minus lambda x is u minus 1 multiply with the minus 1 1 minus u so now take on both sides the logarithm you have minus lambda x is the logarithm of 1 minus u okay divide by the minus lambda you have 1 divided by lambda with the minus Okay, maybe make this a bit nicer. X is minus one divided by lambda logarithm of one minus u. Yeah, so u is here your uniform. So this is how we now generate out of the uniform the exponential distributed x. Okay, so we apply the inversion method to generate an exponential distributed random variable from a uniform distributed random variable. So here's my uniform u. I plug that in and I get my exponential distributed random variable x by taking minus 1 divided by lambda log 1 minus u. So this exponential distributed random variable has a nice interpretation. This guy is used to model default times, for example. So some event, so the time of some event. So it is a stochastic time. It is a random time tau. So my random time tau maps from omega to zero included and infinity. And the probability that tau is less or equal some given time. So the probability that the event occurs before or on little t. This is my distribution function. This is 1 minus exponential minus lambda t. So the opposite event, this is 1 minus 1 minus exponential minus lambda t. So this is just exponential minus lambda t. So this is the event that tau is larger than little t. So this is that my default is after t. So there's no default before t. So this means that I survive up to time t. So this is an important quantity, this is called the survival probability. So the probability to survive up to time little t 
without that the event happens. Yeah? Also a model for the failure of some machine. Yeah? Yeah, a machine can break down and this is now the probability that the machine will operate up to time little t. You get an even better intuition for this uh, distribution if you observe that this model follows just from a single assumption. Namely here this assumption 8 that the trigger which leads to this event so to this default event is in a certain sense memoryless. So the probability that tau is larger than the time t2 conditional to tau being larger than time t1. So the probability that I will survive up to time t2, given that I already know I have survived up to time t1. So this means in a certain sense, you are only in the interval from t1 to t2. This probability actually just depends on this interval length. So it is the same as surviving from now, little t equals zero, up to time t2 minus t1. So just surviving this interval. So in other words, the probability that the trigger occurs within a certain time interval, given that it did not occur before, this only depends on the length of the time interval. So you can write the conditional probability, so the probability that we survive up to time t2, given that we survived up to time t1 in the following form. So this is the probability of the intersection of the two sets. Yeah? So the set of which I would like to obtain the probability intersected with the set that provides the condition. So both are observed. Yeah? So the probability that tau is larger than t2 intersected with the probability that tau is larger than t1 relative to yeah, the probability of the condition. Yeah? So the probability that we survive up to time t1. This is just the definition of the conditional probability. And now you observe that what you have here on top, yeah, this is the intersection of tau larger than t2 and tau larger than t1, but tau larger than t1 is a subset of tau larger than t2. So this on top here is just the probability that we survive up to time t2. So then you just have here the ratio surviving up to time t2 divided by surviving up to time T1. Well, the probability is decreasing. Yeah, The probability to, to survive longer and longer is decreasing. So this means this number here is smaller than that number. Yeah? Of course, it is a conditional probability. So if you plug this in now in number eight, actually, you get now a different version, say, of number eight. Let's call it eight prime. Yeah. So I plug this here into my assumption that this tau is memoryless in this sense. Yeah? And then I just get that, move this here to the other side. Yeah? Then you just have the probability to survive up to time t2. This is the probability to survive up to time t1 multiplied with the additional part, the probability to survive this interval from T1 to T2. So this here is our interval from T1 to T2. We easily check that the exponential distribution satisfies this. Yeah? So if you take now the eight prime, then 
to check this, this just means that exponential minus lambda t2, this is the survival probability to survive up to time t2. This is yeah, exponential minus lambda t1 and then multiplied with the exponential minus lambda t2 minus t1. Okay, because the product of the two exponentials is just the exponential of the sum. So it's just lambda t1 plus lambda t2 minus t1. So in sum, just lambda t2. The funny thing is that this condition here will lead to the exponential distribution. So the other way around is also true. Yeah? Not only fulfills the exponential distribution this condition, if we have this condition, then we have an exponential distribution. So conversely, if the trigger is memoryless, then this implies that we have an exponential distribution. How do we see this? Yeah, let's check the distribution function. So the probability to survive, say, capital T. Now I take, for the capital T, I take some partitioning into sub-intervals. Yeah? So here's my capital T, here's my zero. Okay, and then we just have some intervals, say, n different intervals. So I have here a ti. This is i divided by n times t. Then with this condition yeah, that the probability has this product structure, yeah, I can now represent the probability to survive up to time capital T as just the product of surviving all these intervals. Yeah? So this is the probability to survive up to T divided by N. And then it's the product over all those intervals. Yeah? So I from one to n. But actually the intervals are all the same. Yeah. So actually the interval size does not depend on the i. And this condition here tells me that it does not depend on where this interval is. Yeah. It's the same as the interval from zero to t1. So since there's no i, yeah, I just have now the probability to survive the small interval t divided by n to the power of n. Okay, so this product here in front is now just uh, to the power of n. Okay, so my probability to survive up to time capital T, this is just the probability to survive up to time capital T divided by N to the power of N. So now I can write this to the power of N in a little bit more complicated way. Yeah. So A to the power of B is yeah exponential logarithm of B e logarithm closed multiplied with N. So inside the logarithm, I have the probability to survive the little interval capital T divided by N. So I have just written the to the power of N in a little bit more complicated way. Yeah, I know. I make it a little bit more complicated if I write the N, the multiplied with N, I write it as uh, divided by one divided by n, and I give me an additional capital T here. 
Yeah, okay, why am I transforming this? Yeah, because now it looks almost like the distribution function, actually one minus the distribution function, because we are here with the opposite event. Yeah, it's the survival event, not the default event. So this looks almost like the distribution function, exponential lambda minus lambda t. Yeah, the n was arbitrary. So this holds for all n. So I can make the interval infinitesimal small. So what we now do is we take here from this part here inside, from this part we take the limit for n to infinity, making the interval arbitrary small, just using it at an infinitesimal interval. And now let's just call this guy minus lambda. Yeah, then we just have that the probability to survive up to time capital T is just exponential minus lambda T. So I have an exponentially distributed random variable. Yeah, what is now the lambda? Yeah, lambda is the limit, actually minus lambda is the limit, so lambda is minus the limit of the logarithm to survive a small interval t divided by n divided by the interval length t divided by n limit n to infinity. Well, this looks a little bit like a derivative, yeah? So the n goes to infinity, and here you have a t divided by n. So this means you take a small interval, say from zero to little t, and you let the little t go to zero. You make it smaller and smaller. And this looks like a derivative. You differentiate this function here with respect to little t, and you plug in t equals zero. So if you differentiate this function, you actually get d by dt logarithm of p tau larger than tau. Yeah? If you differentiate this, okay, you get Differentiating the logarithm is one divided by what's inside yeah, the function. So this is multiplied with the inner derivative dp by dt divided by probability. Yeah. But if you then plug in t equals zero, this guy here below will be one. So for t equals zero, this is the derivative of the probability in zero. Yeah. So actually minus. So the lambda is here the probability, how the probability changes, decays yeah, in, in zero. A remarkable property. Note that this here, that we have an exponentially distributed random variable, just followed from this assumption that this trigger that leads to the event is memoryless. Yeah, here is a small picture of our model. If I interpret this as yeah, a default time, then maybe you have a default probability p then you arrive at the default event, or you have a survival probability one minus p. So in this case here, the one minus p is my exponential minus lambda, and then the length of the time interval I'm looking at, delta t. Yeah? So if this here is now my time interval, Delta T, okay, I have a certain probability to survive and one minus that probability to default. If you survive, the game repeats, you have a certain probability P to default again and a one minus P 
to survive again, and so on. So the probability to survive n intervals is 1 minus p to the power of n. Again, a little bit for the interpretation. If tau models a time, and this is also something that I like to teach very often if I look at mathematical finance, that you should think a little bit like in physics, yeah, thinking about units. Yeah, What is the unit of a quantity? For example, a payment has the unit currency, yeah, euro, but for example, an interest rate yeah, is actually something per time. Yeah. It's um, a multiplicative factor to a payment per time. And if tau models a time, yeah, then probability is unitless. Then we see from probability tau less or equal t is 1 minus exponential minus lambda t. So I see that this here needs to be unitless. So lambda times t Lambda has to have the unit one divided by time. So you also see this from the inversion of the distribution function. We take a uniform random number u, unitless from the computer. I take one minus u, unitless. I can apply the logarithm to a unitless quantity. I apply the logarithm. And then that has to be transformed to a time. So this part here is unitless. And if I now multiply with one divided by lambda, okay, then one divided by lambda has to have the unit time. So if one divided by lambda has the unit time, lambda has the unit one divided by time. So this lambda is a frequency. And one divided by lambda is a time. Yeah, the lambda is a frequency. Maybe that lambda is how often do I get this event, no? a frequency. If one divided by lambda is a time, what time is it? Well, it's actually the expected time of default. Let's check this. Yeah? So let's calculate the expectation of tau. So I calculate the expectation here of my random time tau. Well, I know calculating the expectation here in this case is just integrate over the domain. The domain is uh, all times from zero to infinity. Yeah, then the t times the density phi dt. The density phi, we have calculated that already the density phi is lambda exponential minus lambda t. So I have to integrate t times lambda exponential lambda times t. Okay, so you need to do um, integration by parts. Yeah, You differentiate the t and you integrate the exponential, the lambda times the exponential, Okay, this removes the lambda in front of the exponential. And then you have to integrate again. Yeah, and this gives you another one divided by lambda in front. So you can indeed check that this gives you a one divided by lambda. One divided by lambda is the expected time yeah, when the event happened. And lambda is the frequency of the events. So now we have a pretty good intuition and we know how to generate such a sequence of random times. Before we yeah, maybe implement this in the computer and play a little bit with it, uh, let's recall that it is important to look at the limit cases. I had this little remark here in the last session that you should check a little bit on the domain of inversion. So, that was, for example, relevant for the normal distribution. 
Yeah? Where zero is mapped to minus infinity and one is mapped to plus infinity. So recall that from the last session for the normal distribution, you had this thing that the values zero and one are mapped to minus and plus infinity. And if you have a numerical calculation and minus and plus infinity occur, this could ruin a little bit your result in the floating point arithmetic, yeah? because averaging over something that contains a minus or plus infinity and then always gives a minus or plus infinity or not a number. So how is this here? So my inversion of the distribution function is as follows. I start with a uniform u, and then what we do is take one minus that u, apply the logarithm, apply minus one divided by lambda, and that gives me now my tau, my random time tau. Okay, if you plug in u equal zero, if my random number generator generates here a u equal zero, the one minus u is a one. The logarithm of one uh, is zero. Uh, e to the power of zero is one. So I multiply minus one divided by lambda with zero, so the tau is zero. So u equals zero corresponds to tau equals zero. And if you now have this expression that you compare uh, tau with some given time, yeah? for example, if you look at the survival probability, do you survive? Yeah, then tau equals zero means that the event happens immediately. So I have default just now. Yeah? And u equals one, yeah, u equals one means one minus u is zero. Logarithm of zero is a minus infinity. I multiply with minus one divided by lambda. This will be a plus infinity. So u equals one will map to tau equals plus infinity. So this has the interpretation, yeah, probability that tau is larger than t, yeah, all t fulfill this, this has the interpretation that the event happens never. Okay, and in between, yeah, in between zero and one, zero and one not included, it's mapped to just a positive number. If you just make a comparison, yeah, so for example, if you just make the comparison am I before the default time, yeah, then this limit case is harm harmless because such a test here is little t less or equal positive infinity. This test is always true. Yeah? So it happens never. Yeah? So you are still before the default time. So if you are in this situation that you generate these numbers just to check did default happen already yeah, before or after little t then it's actually not a problem that the random number generator could generate a plus infinity actually the generator we have looked at yeah the linear concurrential ones and mass and twister they can generate zero but they do not generate one so actually, we generate just very large numbers, but we do not generate the plus infinity. But if you would have a generator that generates u equals one, if you just have a code that uses these default times for testing, then it's not a problem. If you have a code that calculates an expectation of the times, then maybe you have to be a little bit careful. It's always nice to see a little bit of code. Yeah, let's just quickly implement this. Okay, maybe I do it live. So let's go to here my small live repository. Yeah, I just want to implement very quickly a class that generates default times. How do we call this? Let's call it default time exponential distribution. 
Okay, so what properties do I have? I would like to have a general random number generator for the uniform. Yeah, and maybe I have a prop property that tells me the lambda. Let's generate a constructor. Let him do the work. Okay, so now I can initialize this class. And now I just want to have a method that gives me the next element in my sequence of exponential distributed default times. Yeah, what do we do? So my task is just implement this formula to generate the uniform. Take your uniform generator and take the next element from that one. Transform to the exponential distributed one. We we'll implement this formula here. So this is minus one divided by lambda multiplied with the logarithm of one minus the uniform. And return this time. Maybe I would like to play a little bit with this and have a few tests. So let's also create some small experiment. So let's call this default time exponential distribution experiment. And yeah, maybe let's try that with a quasi random number generator and the pseudo random number generator. So let's uh, define some number of samples, take 10,000, let's define some lambda, okay, say 0.2, yeah? so one divided by 0.2 is five, Yeah. so the expected time of default would be five. And let's now create a plot. Well, a plot with Mersenne Twister. So I use Mersenne Twister with some random number seed, our lambda and our number of sample points. So I have to create this method. Okay, but this method should not use Mersenne Twister exclusively. It should work with any random number generator 1D. Yeah, so this here is my uniform sequence. Because I would also like to test this with maybe the van der Korput sequence. Say, take van der Korput sequence with base two. So I would like to generate now in these two cases from the uniform one, an exponential distributed sequence of yeah, default times of random times. Yeah, let's just initialize our class. So my default time exponential distribution. So I need to pass my random number generator, okay, the uniform sequence and the lambda. Yeah? He's already filling that for me. Yeah because he knows that I have chosen exactly the same names here in the constructor. Huh? So he knows what to fill in. Yeah, let's uh, plot a few um, points. So let's print the I and then maybe print the time that we have. So I take the time. Okay, maybe I don't like to do this for all these 10,000 sample points. Yeah, maybe I just do it with for the first, let's say 10. Then I print these. I will create a histogram of all these guys. Yeah, so I will later do a little bit more with all the 10,000s, but let's just print these guys. Okay, so this first one here is the one with the Mersenne Twister. The second one is the one with the Mersenne Van der Korput sequence. Maybe let's make the output a little bit nicer. Let's create some kind of title. So the title should be what 
random number generator do we use? And what is the lambda? Uh, what is the Unicode for lambda? It's uh, zero three pp. So let's print this title, and when we are done, maybe print. and some separator. Okay, so now it looks like this. Hmm? There's a nice title, exponential distribution with mesent twister. This is our seed, this is our lambda. Okay, he generates now here some random default times. Yeah? 3, 9, 7, 15, 5, 2, 24, 7, 1. With the van der Korput sequence also some random times. 3, 1, 6, 0. Well, recall the Van der Korput sequence base two. The first one was one half. Okay, this is the time where one half is mapped to. Then it's one over four. Then it's three over four. So he jumps to the other side, la, larger than one half, three over four. Then the next one is one over eight. Then it's one half plus one over eight. Yeah, so it is five over eight. So a little bit after one half but before the three over four. So you see that he's just distributing now the random times like in the van der Korput sequence, but he's also creating very large times yeah, when the van der Korput sequence is approaching the one and very small times when the van der Korput sequence is approaching the zero. Okay. Maybe I also calculate a few numbers yeah so actually what is the expected time so for that i need to calculate the sum of all times and calculate the average by dividing this to number of samples let's uh, also print this so this is now the expectation of my random tau so the Unicode for Chao, 0, 3, C, 4. This is now my average time. Yeah, my lambda is 0 0.2. I would expect um, 5. Okay, the expectation of my Tau is indeed 5.00. Oh, that's quite quite good here. Yeah, Van der Korput is even worse. Yeah, 4.99. Actually, convergence rate for Van der Korput should be better because this is just the Monte Carlo integral that we are calculating. What is the survival probability? So how would you calculate now the survival probability? Yeah, for that, we need a counter, a counter that counts the events where we survive. Yeah. So this is now my my survival counter, which I initialize to zero, okay, it's an integer. Yeah, which time would we like to survive? Yeah, maybe I define some maturity. Okay, maybe 5.0. So do we survive maturity? So if time, my random time, my sample time is larger than my maturity, then I increment my survival counter. So my survival probability is the number of events where I have survived divided by the total number of events that has to be casted to a double. Let's print this guy. So this is the expectation that tau is larger than t, yeah? So with, say, capital T, <clears throat> with capital T being this maturity. Okay, let's try this. Okay, this is an 0 0.37, 0.367. Okay, what is the analytic solution of the survival probability? So this is exponential minus 
lambda times capital T. Okay, let's also calculate this. So exponential minus lambda times maturity. Okay, so this is a CO367. Yeah, okay, so this is quite okay. So we just verify our results. Yeah, if you like to have a plot yeah, of the density, I can also easily create now some density plot. So these are my default times. I create just a list where I store them. Uh, I have to take a different name here. Mm. So maybe I rename this here, default time sequence. And then I can name this here default times. Okay. So from my default time sequence, I get the next default time. And now what I like to do is I just def I just add this to this list. Yeah? So I have a collection of all these default times and now I would like to plot this. So I have a small helper function, create density, create density of these default times. This is the number of buckets in this density plots and this is the standard deviation. Now well, let's have a look how this looks. Okay, now he creates these two plots. Well, maybe I also like to add the title. I can just take the title which I have created here. Okay, and you see the results with the Mersentwister. Yeah? It's wiggling because Mersentwister is really pseudo random. I have the not so evenly spacing. And the one with the Fanda corporate sequence, quite smooth, yeah, small wiggles sometimes. Okay, the exponential distributed random path. Yeah, maybe sometimes it's nice to see these lines here, yeah, so simple lines like that. So how do you check for survival and how do you generate the sequence? So a little bit more complicated is the inhomogeneous exponential distribution. So that means this constant lambda, this is now replaced by a lambda of S. Yeah. So I have an integral here, integral from zero to T lambda of S dS. So given some function lambda that maps zero infinity to zero infinity such that this integral from zero to capital T lambda of S ds yeah, is unbounded, then this distribution function one minus exponential minus integral from zero to T lambda of S ds this is called the inhomogeneous exponential distributed random variable. We can apply the inversion method, the inverse of the distribution function. So if now capital lambda is this integral, lambda SDS, yeah? and if the inverse is known, lambda inverse, then I can just invert the distribution function in the same way, and the one divided by lambda which is the inversion of lambda multiplied with, yeah, is then just replaced with the inverse of that lambda. Yeah? So take a uniform u, yeah, do just as before, one minus little u, apply the logarithm, actually now minus the logarithm, and then apply the inverse of 
Lambda. So if this Lambda is one, for example, in the homogeneous case here, then actually this minus logarithm one minus u is your default time. And the one divided by lambda is just shrinking or expanding a little bit the times. So it is a time change. And you can take the same interpretation here. So this part here is exponentially distributed random variable with lambda equals one. Okay, and then you take this capital lambda inverse to remap the time. Often you do not have the inverse maybe of this integral. So here is a good yeah, trick. You are creating models yeah, for uh, things you observe. So it's maybe a model for the default of a company. And maybe this model has to be calibrated to what you observed in the past or what you expect to happen to some data. Yeah. So actually it's not so clear yeah, how the model should look like, how many free parameters the model should have. So in many applications, it's sufficient to just consider a discretized version of this lambda because you do not observe so much data yeah, to fit the whole continuum yeah, or to imply the whole continuum of this lambda, little lambda of S. So in practical applications, it is often sufficient to just consider a discretized version or consider an additional discretization step. So what I do is I introduce now lambda i, which is the average of my lambda of s over some time interval from ti to ti plus one. So now you can take two viewpoints. Either you are taking the lambda of s and you're performing a discretization, which is an approximation, or you just say from the beginning that your model is a piecewise constant function. So either you could say that your lambdas are constant on the intervals yeah, from ti to ti plus one. So this is a model assumption. So you are modeling the inhomogeneous exponential distribution with a piecewise constant intensity function, lambda is called the intensity, or you can view the lambda i's as piecewise constant approximations. So let's take the first view and assume that my lambda is from the beginning uh, piecewise constant. Then I have an analytic formula for my distribution function. So my f of little t is one minus exponential. And now the minus capital lambda, this can be written as a sum. Yeah? So this is now the integral, yeah? a sum from t0 to, well, actually ti, where ti is the time discretization point that is just before the little t, yeah? So the little t is between ti and ti plus one. So then your distribution function is the sum over all the previous you know, constant parts plus lambda i times little t minus ti. Yeah? This here is the integral from ti to little t lambda of s ds, yeah? the last partial integral. So in this uh, distribution function, this can be inverted. So here is how the inversion looks like. So the first thing is that you generate your random time z out of your uniform. The random time z, that 
corresponds to lambda equals one. Then you search for this interval, ti to ti plus one, by finding the index i, such that z is in between, okay, what do we, we have here on this side? This is the capital lambda of ti, and this is the capital lambda of ti plus one. So I know that my time transformed default time has to be between ti and ti plus one. I would like to invert the lambda. Yeah, and then I just solve this last step here. Okay. There the lambda is constant. Yeah, so it is one dividing by lambda i times z minus capital lambda of ti. So this is now my starting point in the say normalized time in the z time. This is my starting point. And then I take just the difference z minus capital lambda ti. So this is the z here to get the transformed time tau. So this is how you would uh, generate an inhomogeneous exponential distribution. Maybe a little bit more involved because first you should maybe generate here these lambda ti's, yeah, and then you just do a first step inversion of the distribution function. Then you do some search for the i parameter. Okay, and once you have done that search, okay, you have this additional step here. Okay, so that was our session on the exponential distribution. So here's our coding session. Generate a sequence of uniform random numbers, transform it to an exponential distributed random number sequence. Use Mersenne Twister, use the Van der Korput sequence. So that was here. And you find this in default time exponential distribution experiment in the package random numbers in our lecture repository.